Okay. So we were discussing Markov decision processes, right? We've, so what a Markov decision process is, how it, it is basically a controlled Markov problem. In general, we, we learned how to uh, formulate it, and then we also learned how to uh, construct a linear program to solve the problem, right? And I was also mentioning about mentioning that there was another algorithm called policy improvement algorithm, and that's what we are going to discuss, what we are going to learn today, right? So we'll learn today how to solve, okay, Markov decision problems. I should say, I guess, the Markov decision. Problems by or with uh, policy improvement, policy improvement algorithm. Okay, just to remind you what a Markov decision problem looks like, right? We introduced last time the so called Markov decision process. Okay. Maybe assume that we have a stochastic process X, okay, which is a controlled Markov chain on some state space E, which has only a finite number of states, which we labeled by 0, 1, and so on until M. Okay, there are M plus one states, and the decision process uh, moves like this, right? After we observe, after we observe that the chain, or that the process X is, let's say, in state I, I being anything in, the st in our state space, okay? We take an action, we take in action K, right? K being in the set of allowable or permissible actions, right? There are capital K of them. And then several things happen right after this. The first of all, okay, as a consequence, as a consequence, okay, first of all, we pay an immediate expected cost CIK, right? So we taking, uh, having taken uh, action K in state I costs us immediately, right? Something which is on average equals CIK, okay? And our action also affects how the process is going to uh, move forward in the following sense. The Markov chain X right, goes to one okay, of the states, let's say J, okay, in our state space, and uh, during or in the next in the next transition with a probability that depends both on the initial state i and the action that we have just taken in that state and we denote it like this or by this right going in one step from state i to state j when we take action k right so that summarizes or just describes completely how this process X controlled Markov process X moves forward along with the costs associated with each of these uh, um, with, with each of our choice of a decision or an action right? we then also introduce define uh, stationary policies right? a stationary and deterministic policy, okay, we denote it by R, and it consists of what actions matched 
assigned to each one of the states in our state space, right? So this is supposed to be the action assigned to state zero, right? R1 through Rm, right? Each one of them are supposed to be in the set of permissible actions. So this thing, right? A stationary deterministic policy prescribes basically a rule, right? Prescribes that action, right? In this case, Ri is taken every time when Markov chain enters state i. Okay? Every time Markov chain enters into state i, if we are following this particular policy, then we are uh, supposed to take action ri. Okay? And you can come up many policies, alternative policies, stationary and deterministic policies, and our objective was to find, right, a stationary and deterministic policy right which minimizes long run right which minimizes long run expected average cost per time unit right and that was our problem okay as I said last time, we learned how to formulate a linear program to solve this problem, to find a stationary deterministic policy with minimum expected, long run expected average cost. How to find, learn how to formulate, right? Formulate NLP to find an optimal, right, an optimal um, stationary deterministic policy okay, and today we will, we are going to see, we are going to learn the so-called how to, how to use the uh, policy improvement algorithm to solve the same problem, right Policy improvement algorithm typically converges faster than, or the, the number of uh, iterations you have to uh, uh, perform with the uh, policy improvement algorithm is a lot smaller than the number of the iterations that is a simplex algorithm will be should be run in order to solve the corresponding LP uh, model, right? So for large problems, sometimes it is also useful actually to know policy algorithm, policy improvement algorithm. It typically takes between three to fifteen steps to uh, to find the optimal solution by using policy improvement algorithm. That's actually what people report uh, in various different uh, problems, and we don't really understand very well how such universal numbers actually apply to a wide variety of problems. People working on different types of problems, they just report how many steps or iterations they actually use uh, policy improvement algorithm until they find or uh, find uh, an optimal solution that ranges typically between those two numbers irrespective of how big the state space or how many actions you have, as long as they are finite. That turns turns out to be a, uh, an advantage of this algorithm. Okay. Uh, okay. So perhaps then we, we should know we should look closer what this algorithm is about and how why how it works and how we can use it to solve our problems. Okay. The the first thing that we will discuss 
is the following identity that is key to policy improvement algorithm. We will see that for every policy R, okay, under which Markov chain X is irreducible and aperiodic, this last piece is really not necessary, but we, this, we learn how to calculate stationary distributions under this assumption only. Uh, in the future, if you need actually more, uh, 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 if need to apply the same algorithm to a wider uh, Markov chain, then you can actually study the details on your own. So for every policy R under which X is irreducible and aperiodic, okay, we will see that there are numbers which I will denote by G of R, okay, and so there is a vector of VIs associated with the same policy R assigned to each of these states, right? So in our case, you know, you remember that the state space consists of M plus 1 states, right? So we are talking about M plus 2 numbers, okay? For every policy R, there are numbers like this such that they all satisfy the following system of linear equations. So GR plus VI of R equals, okay, CI of R, okay, plus one step transition probability of going from state I to J under, if you are using policy R, times, again, VJ, right, the state, uh, the function associated with the state into which you are moving, okay, where the sum is, again, taken over the state space, taken over all states, right. So j goes from 0 to n. So we have one such, in, such, one such equation for each state i in the state space, namely for each i between 0 and n. Okay. Okay. I'll give an intuitive explanation why we should expect uh, that, that such an equation will exist. And we will also give meanings to these numbers. Okay. Th that is going to be important. It is going to be important to understand what this is and what the role they play, these numbers, and why this is true for any, I should say, stationary deterministic policy. Sometimes I skip this thing, but remember that we are trying to solve that problem that we identified over there, right? Namely, we are interested in finding a stationary deterministic policy that will minimize, that, that is going to have the long run, minimum long run expected average cost per time unit. Here, well, what is this? This is the immediate expected cost. Immediate expected cost in the same notation, if I use the same notation that I introduced before, where is that? Right? Here, what did we say? Whenever you take action K in state I, you pay that. And this is actually CI in state R. If you are following policy, stationary policy R, then you know that you are taking, you will, you will have to take action R sub I, right? Okay, so this is nothing but immediate expected cost, CI uh, comma, if you wish, RI, right? incurred when you incurred maybe I should say in state I while following policy R. Okay. This this is not so convenient to use all the time, therefore I is I will instead use this one. Okay. But that it is not a completely new stuff. So it is actually another way of writing this thing. Similarly, this is nothing but one-step transition probability, 
transition probability PIJ when you take action R sub I now you are in state I right? if you are following uh, policy R then you know that you have to take action R I right when this action is taking is taken then the probability that in one step you will be going from state I to J is going to be given by this so I just uh, uh, drop this part and write simply like this right once the transition probability under policy R, okay so both of both notations are there just for convenience for us to write things easier okay and why is this true why why do you think we have such an equation and what, what are really those numbers G sub R and uh, G, G of R and uh, VI of R we will see in a moment okay we will see the this thing actually G sub R is nothing but the long run expected average cost per time unit and if we use simply the stationary distribution of the Markov chain under this policy R we know that we can write this thing as what fraction of time is spent in state I if you follow policy R times the immediate cost paid immediate expected cost paid when you are in state I and you are following policy R right and we sum all these uh, products right over all states in the state space okay okay we will say that this is the case and and actually the I of R may be interpreted as relative values or the relative in this case I fixed I right the relative value of starting at time zero in state I and if you follow of course uh, policy R and just let me try to convince you that these are this interpretations are appropriate right so this equation should be true for let me write that piece here for every i between 0 and m okay okay so to see that these are the correct interpretations and they in fact together satisfy this equation we'll introduce another object okay okay by definition I am going to define this so this is different as you can see from one of these right there is n a superscript n and we will use this notation to denote expected total cost okay expected total cost in the next n steps right so n there just counts how many steps into the future we are looking as we are collecting all the costs right expected total cost in the next n steps right if we operate Markov chain X under policy R so this explains the dependence on R on the left hand side starting at time 0 at time 0 in state I right? that also now 
clarifies why i is there. Right? So we can actually write this in terms of the random variables we introduced already. Right? So expected total cost total cost in the next n steps. So there is a there is a summation, right? Let's choose k as the time steps from zero to n minus one. Right? So what are the costs? Every time the Markov chain enters, let's say state J, we know that we will pay cost C J of R. Right? So this is gonna be incurred at every time K if chain is in state J, right? Well, J is one of many possible states or finite number of states that the chain X can be in that state at time K. So we, are, we have to just account for all possible costs, right? So state, states uh, change from zero to M, right? There are M plus one states, right? So at time K, the immediate expected cost that we pay equals to this one, right? Whenever, if state or the chain at time k, if the chain is in state j at time k, then this is the cost that we pay, right? And we just sum all these instantaneous costs, right? Uh, over all times from k equals zero to n minus one, right? And we condition on uh, we calculate the condition expectation of this given that at time zero, right, we start in state i, so we have that, and the, unlike or the different uh, uh, from what we used to use in earlier classes, let me also put a subscript r below expectation. That will always remind us that actually all the expectations, right, are taking uh, are, are being taken in such a way that we never forget that once the transition probabilities are determined by this policy. Right? So we know that, that with this expectation, once you move inside, you are dealing with the probability that in J steps, you move from state I to K, right? and those probabilities depend on actions you take at each time, and they are actually prescribed by this policy R. Right? We have R over there, we should not forget. Right? And let us just go ahead and calculate this. So we can we know that expectation and summation can be interchanged, right? Especially this sum over J has nothing to do with this sum over K and R uh, and expectation. So we can just take this outside. And since the instantaneous or immediate expected cost doesn't depend on time either, so we can take that outside as well. And then what is left? Let me also take this outside. That doesn't bother us either, I guess. Right? So then this is over k. This sum is over k. Then what is left? The expected value of the indicator random variable, where we, which becomes 1 whenever xk equals j. But its expectation then becomes what? The probability, probability that xk equals j, and even we can then write that in terms of what? A one-step transition matrix, right? In k steps, we move from i to j, right? But we should not forget that this is the probability, one-step probability matrix determined by policy R. Right? This is one-step Maybe it is even more appropriate, but this is still fine. But just this is the first time we are writing this. Maybe we should. Well, this even doesn't make sense if I unless I put this outside. Maybe this makes more sense, right? There is a once the transition probability matrix determined by policy R. We take the kth power of that to find the case the transition probability matrix. Then we look at the IJ entry, right? So this, as you see, is a little messy. Therefore, we just uh, we are willing to forego all the true interpretation and use this more convenient compact notation 
uh, instead of this, but we should never forget that what happens is basically actually we have a one-step transition matrix determined by R. We take k uh, power of that matrix and then we are looking at the IJ entry. Right? Okay, now I said well, it is going to be important. We will be working actually with this function as we are uh, fulfilling all uh, the requirements that we put forward before. And now we know that it can be written like this, right? And at, right at this point, you may also realize that after you divide both sides by n, right? So first of all, this is true, of course, for every i, and for every state between 0 and m, right? And if I divide by n, right? Then on the right-hand side, you have this, the sum over all states between 0 and m of what? Cji times, let me just take that 1 over n inside, okay? Even let me just leave a little space here, times the sum over time k between 0 and n minus 1 of k-step uh, k transition probability from going i to j under policy i. Right? After you divide by n, then you see that if I let n go to infinity, this is a limit. Because right? we assume from the beginning that policy under stationary policy r, chain X is irreducible and aperiodic, therefore it is a regular Markov chain, then we have every right to talk about its stationary probability distribution. And we also know that under this under these conditions, since the Markov chain is regular, right, the stationary probability distribution also is the same as the limit, the time, the expected fraction of time spent in state J. In fact, we know that this doesn't really depend on us. That, also, that is also going to be important. So we'll say that, okay, this Hayes limit, first of all, as n goes to infinity, right? And the limit, the value of this limit, right, is independent of the initial state i. Right? Because this doesn't depend on I in the limit, when I take the limit. Therefore, this should not depend on I. Right? Uh, let us take the limit. I should have, I, I could have done there, but let me just keep it as it is. Uh, so that you can spot later what is going on. Right? And let us just evaluate the limit for our records. Right? When I take this limit, then of course, since this, there is this finite sum over there, I can interchange the limit and the sum. There's 1 over n times sum as k changes from between 0 and minus 1 of these numbers. And we know that this is now pi, not i, but pi j. And to show okay, its dependence on the Markov chain and its dependence on policy r, let's just also use this notation. Okay. And we can write it compactly as what? C i r times pi j of r. Okay? So this is the fraction of time the Markov chain spends in state j under policy r, and this is the immediate expected cost that we pay in whenever we are in state i as we follow policy r. Right? And we gave to this a name before, right? I used this notation, right? So the right hand side is nothing but right a g of r if I use the same notation over there, right? right? So, here, let's also take a note of this new notation we introduced, 
Okay. So pi r, which is the probability distribution over the state space consisting of probabilities pi 0 r, pi 1 r, and so on, till pi m r, right, is what the unique, is the unique stationary unique stationary distribution of the Markov chain X under policy R. Okay? Alright? And we will now use this particular relation, okay? That the limit exists, the limit of this quotient exists and is independent of I, okay? And uh, therefore we can, for large, and at least, approximately, we can calculate this quotient, or, um, right, estimated by this number G of R, right, for large N. And this also tells us that perhaps this can be almost approximately, approximately, calculated by n times g of r plus, right, uh, something, right, a quantity, maybe I should just write a quantity which vanishes as n goes to infinity after divided by N. Okay. That's clear from this relation, right? If you divide both sides by n, right, the quotient for large n equals so the n is gone here, should equal to g of r. Whatever is left here, right, after you divide by n and let n go to infinity, should just vanish, right? That's just uh, the, uh, I'm just actually summarizing that observation here, okay? And this may depend, of course, both initial state I and the policy R, so we just give a name to this thing. So let us call it VI of R. So this quantity is then going to actually appear here, okay, later. But so far what we have learned is let me write this one more time. Expected total cost incurred in the first n steps, if you are controlling the Markov chain by using stationary deterministic policy R, starting in state I, can be approximately expressed as what? n times a number that doesn't depend on the initial state, it depends on the policy, but it doesn't depend on the initial state i, right? And you multiply by n, so this is just a rate, right? This is the cost per rate, which we know now understood very well actually where it comes from. They are not quite the same, but we can just correct, or whatever the difference is, we can just give a common name, vi of r, right? Which doesn't depend on n, when you divide by n, right, then it is going to, well, actually, this is, of course, an intuitive uh, uh, um, heuristic derivation, which may, this may depend on n, but the, or the term uh, that depends on n uh, uh, should be on an order less than n, so that when you divide by n, and as n goes to infinity, it should just vanish, right? But now, by, by far, we are basically using our intuition and try to guess the form of this, uh, function later we will uh, uh, rigorously establish uh, at least the equation itself, if not this one. Okay, we have this. Let's say true for every state between zero and m. Okay, and if this is true, then we can also actually give a meaning to these quantities, and you can take actually the same total expected cost over the next n periods, but now starting in two different states. One in, let's say, in state i, and the other in state j, 
Then you start in state J. That's going to be expected total cost you incur in the next n steps, right? And then subtract from this the total cost that you incur in the next step. If you start in state I now, right? If I use the same formula, right? So this term doesn't depend on the state, so they will cancel each other, and the only thing that is left is going to be this number evaluated in state J minus the same number but now evaluated in state I. Right? So when you look at this equation then maybe it is fair to say that Vj is actually giving you the relative value of uh, start relative value or the, the difference uh, in the costs when you start initially in state J rather than I. Right, when you look at the left hand side. So if, if you had a choice uh, in uh, determining initially in which state you will want to start, you may just want to take into account these things, right? So it is going to be cheaper perhaps to start the process in certain states. If this is negative, for example, you would choose J, right? and because this is going to be smaller, this is going to be smaller than this one, right? if uh, you are interested in minimizing the total cost. So um, these uh, relative values are of course independent of n, so they, they, are, they are in a sense a universal uh, indicators of how much costs, how much cost you are expected to, you should expect to incur if you start in state J instead of I, as long as you are actually following policy I, right? So just because of this, Right. Uh, in a sense, Vj of R gives you a measure of how important to start in state J, and for that reason, sometimes people call this thing as the relative value. Relative value of state J under policy R. Okay. Okay. And then, okay, well, by now we kind of figured out uh, what GR and what VIs are going to be and what roles they play and, and how they show up actually in this discussion. And now it is time to figure or just explain why well, all of these values are related to each other as in this uh, uh, as in this equation. And to see that, uh, I guess it is going to be just enough. Let me see. Okay. Uh, that equation is not on blackboard yet. So we, I'm, I'm now going to take a look at this uh, quantity one more time. What was this? This is the total expected cost in the next n steps if you start in initially in state i and you follow r. Now, why don't we apply the first step analysis to this function? Now, we know very well how to use first, first step analysis to calculate uh, right, the costs, for example, until you hit a particular total cost, until you hit a particular state. We will use a similar idea to write this one, right? So this total co expected cost consists of two parts. The first part is the immediate expected cost incurred in state, incurred in state R, in, in state I, plus expected total cost incurred during the remaining, right? Incurred in the next n minus one steps. Okay? Of course this cost is going to depend on what? It is going to depend on the state into which the Markov chain is going to move. Right? Uh, after time one. So 
we know that this is a ci of r right so the when you study state i this is what you pay immediately and that then with probability pij under policy r right the chain is going to move to some state j and once the chain enters state j now you know that the future remaining costs are going to be independent of the past history history of markov chain because it's a markov property so from this point forward in time the remaining total cost is going to be given by uh, uh, by what in the, the the total expected cost in n minus 1 steps starting now initially in state r and by following policy r okay j is just one of n plus 1 possible states so we have to take the sum over the state space Right? So this is nothing but just because of, uh, as a result of the first step analysis. Okay. And for any initial state i, I can repeat this to get one equation for h. So I have all these equations. And do we have any questions about this? All right. If you start in state i, and if you are interested in expected total cost in the next n steps, of course there is a cost that you pay immediately when you are, when you are in state i, but in the next step you will go to some state j, right? The total remaining, ex, expected total remaining cost is going to be what? Starting in whatever state you are going to be in step 1, Right, the total expected cost in the next n minus one time steps, right, under this policy, starting initially as if you start now initially in stage J because of the Markov property, right? We have this, and then, right at this point now we can make use of this equation, right? Even though this is approximately true, we can just actually get then an approximate equation over there. Right? On the left hand side, instead of this expected total cost in the next n periods, I can use this approximation. And on the right hand side, I will just replace this expected total cost in the next n minus 1 step starting in stage i, j, and use this uh, similar uh, approximation. So on the left now, I have what? n times g of r plus relative value, start relative value of state i under policy r, okay, equals at least approximately to immediate cost, expected cost incurred in state i under policy r plus the sum as j changes from 0 to m, once the transition probability from uh, uh, going from I to J under policy R times now when you just uh, adopt that equation for this one then you get what? Now N minus 1 times G of R, right? If G of R is the rate of cost rate, right? In the next N minus 1 steps on average approximately you expect in total this much of a cost plus a correction term which we call uh, as the relative value of state J under policy R. Okay? Now we have this. Okay? Now, on the right hand side, uh, this term doesn't depend on J, right? If you just distribute this quantity, multiply first and then you sum both terms, Right? So we know that the, uh, this just goes out of the summation. The sum over j's is one step transition probabilities will simply give uh, 1. So here we have n minus 1 times g of r plus the second sum is non trivial. So it just stays as it is. And we have this. Where again, sum goes from 0 to n.
Now I have n times g on the left and n minus 1 times g of r on the right. They cancel and there is only one left. Only one of them will survive. Plus, we can just leave this here. V i of r, relative value of state r, right? Approximately equals this sum. Namely, sum as j changes from 0 to m of the product of pij under policy r times relative value of state j again under policy r. We get this equation which is approximately true for all of these states. That's very important. Thank you very much. Yeah. If that is not there, this equation doesn't even make sense. That's true. The costs actually make the entire problem interesting. Okay. CI of R and then the summation, right? PIJ of R times the relative values. How about this? Okay. All right. This is a heuristic derivation of that equation, but in fact, this equation is true all the time. Why is it true? How do we prove that that's out of the scope of this course? Uh, giving all the details, the rigorous de derivation, details of the rigorous de derivation is rather difficult. But for us, it is important just to know that this equation is correct and at least now we have an uh, intuitive explanation why we should expect that this is true. Okay? And when you want to use policy iteration algorithm, the first thing that you are going to be doing is just you will start with any arbitrary policy R and then you will solve this system of equations for this R Right? Once R is specified, then you know all these numbers, and you also know all these numbers. The only things that you don't know in this equation are going to be the relative values, Vj of R, Vi of R, and this quantity, which is long-run expected uh, average cost per time unit. So once R is given, then we, we will first solve all these equations. We have how many equations? Uh, for each R you have one, there are n plus one equations, right? And we will solve these n plus one equations to find all these uh, unknowns, g of R and the relative values, but unfortunately we have n plus two unknowns. One relative value for each state, there are n plus one states, and plus this quantity, there are n plus two unknowns, right? So we don't have enough number of equations to find all these unknowns unless we arbitrarily assign one of the unknowns to some value. That's what we usually do and conventionally we take the relative value of the last state, state M, under policy R and set that to zero. Okay? And that gives, if you want, that gives another equation in addition to n plus 1. So you have now n plus 2 equations. And you can solve for the n plus 2 unknowns. Or in other words, you already figured that out, figured that out uh, one of the values. Then there are n plus 1 values left. You can use the n plus 1 equations to solve for all those n plus 1 inequal, uh, unknowns. Right? So we start with, with any policy R, the first in the first step we solve m plus one equations over there to find g of R and the relative values right of states v i of R for i zero through m minus one, and we already know that the relative value of the last state equals zero, right? And then from here, okay, we use relative values, vi of r, okay, to somehow 
find a new policy let's call it R tilde better than or at least as good as I should say at least as good as R itself so this needs an explanation I'll give that in a moment so now I am kind of uh, outlining how the policy iteration algorithm works right so we you pick any policy R you wish then you solve these equations in order to find what long run expected average cost per time unit and the, these so-called relative values okay that is the so-called uh, well this is the first step and it is called actually as the value determination step value determination step after this you move to step two which is known as the policy improvement step okay and here the purpose your objective what you want to do is actually to somehow come up with a policy which is at least as good as R and as you are doing that we will see in a moment you are using those uh, relative values relative values of the states under policy R that you have just calculated in the previous state uh, in the previous step right and when you come up with R tilde right we know we will see that actually the algorithm the step the details of this step uh, makes sure that it is always at least as good as R and you check whether R tilde is identically the same as R or not right if this turns out to be the case then you stop the algorithm then you know that R or R tilde they are the same in fact right R is going to be optimal okay then we will know that R is optimal and this way we will have found uh, an optimal stationary deterministic policy right if however R tilde the new uh, policy that you have found here is different than R then you continue then you in fact perform another iteration what does an iteration consist of these two steps step one and step two if R tilde is different than R you come back to step one right you replace every R with R tilde namely you solve these equations now for R tilde right you find the long run average long long run expected average cost per time unit for this new policy R tilde you also calculate the relative values of the states under this new policy and then you move again to step to policy improvement step then you are now trying to find another algorithm another policy that is going to be at least as good as R tilde once you found you again check whether that is the same as the one that you uh, star, uh, you, uh, uh, you started with right the next iteration if they are the same now you stop and then you will know that actually R tilde is optimal if not then you actually repeat one more time so when I said when I say at the beginning that it uh, policy improvement algorithm on average needs uh, 3 to 15 iterations on average before it finds an optimal uh, solution there I was referring to one uh, iteration the, or the counts of the iterations right so one iteration consists of two steps and we will see or you will also actually experience yourselves uh, that on average 3 to 15 iterations usually enough to find a, um, uh, an optimal uh, deterministic stationary policy for any given problem as long as of course the state space is finite and action space is finite as we just assumed actually for since the beginning okay now what has remained now I am going to explain you the details of these two steps we already saw uh, 
the details of step one. That's basically this equation. I have to explain to you what exactly the step two is and perhaps give some idea how the, the algorithm or the operation here gives ensures that we have always a policy which is at least as good as any policy that we start with, right? So I, are there any questions by now? Okay, let's just continue after we, we give a 10-minute break. Okay.